forward to the cloud. I believe it started. Um, and I'll make sure to reiterate this question. Uh, but um, thank you everybody for coming to our COVID-19 meetup and check-in. We have moved to a bi-weekly check-in. So every other week we'll be meeting up and having time to discuss and, and ask questions. Um, but thank you all for showing up today. Um, for today's agenda, we have the following topics. We'll do our three deep breaths. Um, we're going to talk briefly about COVID-19 in Montana and just letting you know that there's been a rise in cases this week. Uh, we'll talk about um, recessions and economic impacts on libraries and specifically library budgets. We'll have a brief discussion on virtual programming, some general brainstorming, seeing what questions you all have, concerns, ways that we might be able to support you all, and then go into announcements and new resources. Uh, at any point in time, of course, you are more than welcome to bring up whatever topic for discussion, whatever question. Um, we will be monitoring the chat box and we'll put anything forth to the group. Um, and you know, we welcome any contributions that you have. And just to make sure that this makes it on the recording, uh, someone had asked about checking out laptops. And so a couple libraries have said they've considered checking out Chromebooks, but aren't sure about how to keep them clean between the checkouts. Um, the University of Providence in Great Falls has checked out laptops for several years, and they started with a four day checkout and have now moved to a two week checkout. Um, and Connie in um, uh, Kalispell said that they're starting to check things out on July 1st. So iPads, Surface Pros, and hotspots. Um, so feel free to add anything else if you have uh, things to contribute. But first, we will do our three deep breaths. And today's picture is Waimea Canyon in Hawaii. And I actually took this picture on a vacation many, many years ago. Um, but if you can just sit on your chair, uh, put your feet on the ground, um, make sure your back is straight. Again, you wanna spread your shoulders, bring them down. You don't want any earmuffs um, and really try and open up your chest and also open up your belly so that you can really make sure your breaths go deep into your body and not just in your chest area. So if you like, you can put your hands over your heart. You could put your hands on top of your head you want or you can do cactus arms as you breathe and we'll do three deep breaths so inhale exhale inhale exhale Inhale, and exhale. All right. So the first thing that we wanted to cover was just a quick update on COVID-19 cases in Montana. There has been a rise in daily cases this past week. Um, I'm not sure how how closely people are monitoring. So I just wanted to let you know, there were 32 new cases on um, the 19th. And there were, when shelter in place went into effect on the 26th, March 26th, that was 35 new cases. So since then, it hasn't been 32 new cases every single day, but there has been a slight uptick. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Um, I wanted to share this link, CDC guidelines for office buildings, which doesn't really have anything new per se, but just a reiteration of um, information to be aware of, to be careful of. Um, and also to let you know that uh, Battelle, which is the research organization that's working with the IMLS and Web Junction to test um, COVID on library materials and how long it lasts they just released round one test results. So just to let you know, this is not conclusive. They have not definitively said, but just with their first round of testing in a typical air conditioned office environment, the COVID, um, COVID was not detected on different library materials after three days. 
Um, so that's what they were testing. I do encourage you to look at this uh, web page and read the report um, just so you know exactly which materials they tested and what circumstances um, because again it's not necessarily the same if as as what your library environment is um, but that is that is good news i suppose in that you know the first round of testing wasn't a definitive like this is wrong the thing that we've been doing so for the 72 hour quarantine that a lot of people have been doing um, in the round one testing the covid um, virus was not detected after after three days um, so they are doing round two testing and those results will be available at the end of july so we'll keep a lookout for that information and we'll be sure to share that with you um, but again this is not conclusive this is just the initial round of testing and i do encourage you to take a look at um, the test results um, and uh, read those for yourself. So let me put these into the chat box real quick. So this is first the CDC guidelines. And then this is the Realm project results. Oh, I put a typo. I said real project. <laughs> um, if you have any questions on that, please let me know. Um, and um, Otherwise, we will move onwards. Hey, Amelia, can I just yes. jump in real quick? Yes, please go ahead. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slow chatter. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that we know that your local public health officials are working closely with the state public health officials. There's a, um, an office at the Department of Public Health and Human Services here in Helena that is coordinating with local health officials. So we have shared the Realm uh, report, this first round of testing with that state office, and they're looking at how they can disseminate that information to your local health officials in the hopes that we can get consistent information in their hands as you are working with them as well. Awesome, thanks Jenny. <clears throat> Um, and this, the Web Junction website is the public facing website. So do feel free to share that with anybody if they are interested in learning more. Um, and that's the, the information that they have publicly posted. So um, moving on, we wanted to talk a little bit about um, the recession and economic impacts on libraries. Um, a lot of you have filled out the library services survey. Um, status of library services around the state. And um, of the 54 libraries that have responded to our survey, around 13% um, will experience some kind of decrease in their budget. Um, and so roughly a third of the respondents have also said that they don't know what will happen to their budget. So I think this is something that a lot of people are thinking about, are considering, and are trying to think of ways to prepare for. So we wanted to take some time to discuss that. Um, and Suzanne actually has some information that she wanted to share about that. So Suzanne? Yes, and um, Tracy actually put together a lot of this information. So I'll give her credit on this, um, but she couldn't be here because she's taking some vacation time. So I said, fine, I'll stand in for you. And a lot of this has to do with just telling your story. And um, one of the things that we know is that library usage increases during recessions. And we can find that through public library statistics. Unfortunately, um, we're not able to really tell you that right now and help you put together um, that from our statistics in a really good manner because of um, you know, changeovers in you know, various ways we've been uh, accumulating statistics and you know some of you may remember we had these great tools where we could you know come up with all these nice little graphs and things to help tell these stories you know and because we were thinking well what about the last recession you know what do we know from the last recession um, and we can't really get at that but um, you know in theory <laughs> 
you know, ordinarily you can tell that, you know, with your own statistics, you know, showing just how your library increase, um, how your library usage increases. Um, but even if we don't have really good local information on that, um, Colorado State Library um, has some information from their research section and um, ALA has put together um, some information and they put it in a state of the libraries report. And then there's um, a um, Pew Research Center report from 2017. And some of the things that we know from the, um, from the ALA report is that the number of job seekers using the library increases during recession as they use computers and materials to build resumes, look for and apply for jobs. And so if you have any kind of data to support that, um, I would certainly have that at my disposal to be able to use to make your case. Uh, families increase usage of the library because it offers the best deal when the family is on a reduced budget. So ordinarily, you know, families may be able to buy a lot of the books for their kids. Um, but, you know, if the times are tight, you know, they may choose to um, get those books from the library instead. Um, you know, and those of us who check out movies know that quite often, um, and especially in the era of DVDs, and I'm not quite sure how prevalent that is at this point with everything streaming, but, you know, I think in the last recession, DVD checkout went way up because people weren't um, getting those from stores anymore, they were getting them from the libraries. And some key points from the ALA document and the Harris Poll is that Americans feel the public library improves their quality of life. Americans are turning to the libraries and ever larger numbers for access to resources for employment, continuing education and government services. Americans feel that because it provides free access to materials and resources, the public library plays an important role and giving everyone a chance to succeed. So, um, you know, perhaps using some of that to help tell your story can be helpful. From the Pew Center report, um, some key points from there are people think libraries are important, especially for communities. People like and trust librarians. People think libraries level the playing field for those without vast resources. People believe that libraries have rebranded themselves as tech hubs and people still read books. And one thing that struck me as part of our um, telling our stories is, I don't know how many of you managed to take in all or part of the Rural and Small Libraries Conference that was put on by Library 2.0 last week, but during the keynote, one of the speakers there, Jennifer Pearson, was talking about um, how important relationships are particularly to small libraries. And I think they're important to all of us in libraries, but um, she was saying it's all about relationships, that you, know, you really need to be a politician, a cheerleader, um, and you know, that that's hard for a lot of us, that you know, we certainly didn't learn those skills in library school. We may be introverts rather than extroverts to begin with, so that's kind of difficult, but um, she suggested go where you feel comfortable, where you already have a network, and then let others start to build networks in their areas. And that kind of age old um, idea that it's who you know, not what you know. And so I think, you know, for those of us who've been working on building relationships, it's helpful in good times and it's particularly helpful in the bad times. Um, next slide, please. If you have heard that um, your budget is going to be cut, um, some things to consider in here. Um, are other departments being asked to cut their budgets? If so, by what percentage? If the library is being targeted, it'd be wise for the board to request that the local government officials reconsider and not cut the library's budget as much. If there's no way to avoid a budget cut, what cuts will leave the library best able to bounce back and will cause the least amount of harm? Um, some things that Tracy, you know, had in here, um, can the library reduce the collection budget? Um, it's a line item. 
where you may be able to make up for some of the loss through donations or grants. Um, what other items could be eliminated? Are there ways to make up for that loss by partnering with other departments or libraries? Are there services that the library has been offering where usage over time has changed? Could the library reduce or eliminate those services? What kind of savings would that generate? If the cut's too large, will the library need to lay off staff or reduce hours? What's the impact of that? What will people lose? Consider reducing services if you must reduce staff. And um, I have to say, Tracy is being really nice about this. And I know we as librarians, we generally want to be really nice and we don't want to inconvenience people. We want to offer as much service as we can. Um, I'm going to offer at least a contrary side on here. Um, some libraries, when faced with budget cuts, um, make cuts that are evident and that people feel right away. Um, I'm not advocating either way, but um, as an example, when Seattle Public Library was faced with large budget cuts, um, they started closing down branches, severely shutting down hours. There was this huge uproar in the community because, and, and they weren't just cutting down, cutting back hours in um, poor parts of town. They were cutting back in nice middle class sections. Um, and, you know, they wanted to make sure people were going to feel it. Now, I don't know, you know, how that works with your way of thinking, but um, there is that side of it too, you know. I know we don't want to hurt our populations, but uh, I think it is a perfectly valid premise to let people know that libraries cannot run on uh, peanuts. You know, we do need funding. And, you know, if they don't get the funding, chances are they may lose some programs that, you know, they value and that there is, there is a cost to it. Um, looking to the future, uh, there are things that you can do as well. And one of them is to look for alternate funding. So should the board begin working on a dedicated mill levy for the library? Uh, mill levies give the library some stability as mills dedicated to the library can only be reduced if the amount of revenue received is reduced. So it's not completely fail safe, but um, it is, it does give you a lot more security than uh, depending on the general fund and being dependent on, on the city or county to give you parts of the general fund, especially you know, when they're making cuts in other places. So um, anyway, for those of you who've been through recessions before, um, you know, if you want to offer some of the alternatives that you came up with, I think could be a good discussion point at this point. Um, or, you know, those of you who've heard something, if you have ideas at this point that you want to share, we would love to hear from you because I'm sure a lot of us are concerned about possible, um, possible budget cuts at this point. Out of curiosity, has anybody shared the increased statistics with the public and not just with their staff. Um, Cause I remember when the MSC was like, wow, look how many people signed up. It was like I don't, hundreds of people. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, everyone kind of likes numbers and they like seeing the numbers go up. So those would be something that, you know, might be interesting to share with people. Beth said, a change in services that has direct impact and gets people calling City Hall is cutting hours. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Yep, they noticed that one in a hurry. <laughs> well, it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to have to, um, to have to reckon with, but you know, being prepared and I think kind of having, having an idea as to what you might want to do um, can help when you're actually confronted with it. Mm -hmm. And Susie says, it's hard because we've already cut hours due to the pandemic, which is totally true. Yeah. Um, and it's also, 
I think it's also a little bit, these are unique circumstances because no one is in the building right now. So even if things were cut, it's not immediately visible in the same way um, yeah. that it would be under normal circumstances. Um, oh, Connie says that she has a question. Sorry, uh, yeah. I was muted. <laughs> uh, it was it's kind of a question it's hard to slash, hear, yeah. <laughs> slash comment and you kind of just like hit the, hit the nail right on the head right before mm -hmm. I unmuted here, but you know, it's hard. We are experiencing cuts and um, I've kicked this around and we really cannot demonstrate the impact of those cuts during a pandemic. It yeah. would not at all have the same message, I feel. Yeah, you're right. Because if you've already been closed, saying, oh, we're going to be closed a few days, I go, <laughs> Well, they yeah. just don't really understand. I mean, people's um, thought process mm -hmm. is so unpredictable right now anyway. Mm -hmm. And understanding what is the result of a budget cut versus, uh, yeah, versus pandemic restrictions is challenging. And also, we're just not feeling the support of our local government about um, operations when we can usually mm -hmm. um, have them. And so I think it would just be a very confusing message for mm -hmm. our public here, at mm -hmm. least. Yeah, that's for sure. And Michelle said that she, they were asked to cut $20,000 already, which is large. Pretty, pretty significant for West Yellowstone. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the strategies is to, you know, is to really talk about you know the contributions that you are making during the pandemic and letting people know um, you know as they may have been kind of forgetting about a lot of what was going on is is everyone was sheltering in place of just knowing exactly um, what was still being provided and that you know we were not sleeping on the job we were not taking time off Mm -hmm. You know, we were still working. Mm -hmm. So this is Susie, and so one of the things that we're also really struggling with is a lot of the help that people really need. Um, what we're finding is, you know, help me make these copies, help me do this computer work, and um, you know, it's hard to help people and have the six foot distance. And you know, we've looked into some software, and that doesn't seem really feasible and um, we may be asking people to wear masks if they want one-on-one -on -one help but um, trying to provide help while maintaining the six-foot distance is just super hard and so then people are being frustrated and then they're leaving and they're not getting what they want. Yeah that's also a good point too. Yeah, it's tough when you're when you're wrestling with health versus, and we're wrestling with this all over the place. You know, health versus um, economic issues, and you know where is the right place to to come down on that? I don't think there is a really right answer. Does anyone else have similar struggles or concerns? Um, or even just concrete budget cuts already um, and any conversations around that you'd like to share? Connie says that we've been cut $43,000. Oh my. Yeah. Not due to the pandemic. Was that just originally planned before the pandemic? Um, yeah, the revenue was set at FY20 uh, levels, and that was before you know we began to feel pandemic fall out. And mm -hmm. the message I've received, although I don't haven't looked at the revenue or talked to our financial. Um, or finance department head directly about this recently, but in talking with our county administrator this year, at least this coming fiscal year, we look okay because of the property tax levels. The real estate is 
still booming here. People, it's actually had an uptick of people wanting to move out of metropolitan areas. So we're not really seeing an extreme hit right now on revenue, mm -hmm. but I think it's just the ongoing um, conversation or lack of conversation that we've had with our uh, commissioners about, you know, not agreeing what library services should look like, but really having no avenue to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I asked in the sidebar to have, oh, and there was a cost of living increase. So the cost of living increase we had to absorb from our budget, even though we we're set at FY 20 levels of revenue uh, and the sidebar request to have it be, have it adjusted commensurate with cost of living adjustment was denied. Um, other departments in general were not asked to absorb their own salary increase costs. Mm. So that's just kind of, it's not really a surprise because of how we've been working here in the last couple of years. But mm -hmm. if we do feel it. Well, in Cascade County won't confirm that they are going to give us the last half of this fiscal year's what they owe us. <laughs> I mean, they've been, it, it's our library, it, it's been very difficult for our library to run because what they do is in December, they give us half of what they figure they're going to give us for the year. And then they wait until the end of June to give us, which is the end of the fiscal year to give us the last half of our payment which makes it really difficult to function. But this year, they won't confirm that we're even going to get it. So that would be half of our budget literally gone. Or I'm sure they're going to give us some, but they won't confirm how much, which makes it difficult to plan. For sure. Wow. Hmm. That's... <laughs> That sounds less than ideal, that, but. But I think part of that has to do with the fact that that the delinquencies are high. And so, you know, tax, the second property tax payment comes in in May. Um, and so once the second, it comes in in May and then they distribute it in June. And if they're unsure about the delinquencies, then it, it makes it hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I not to belittle Nancy's point, because that is really, really difficult. But I think all of our local governments are also having a really hard time. Mm -hmm. But last fiscal year, they gave last fiscal year's payment in this fiscal year. <laughs> mm. So we were short half of what they were to give us, which, I mean, we got it this year. But Tracy expressed some concern that she says she's afraid we're going to end up missing out on half of our budget from them at some point because of how they're gradually delaying giving us our money. Mm -hmm. A few comments in the chat box. Jody said, I had my first budget related nightmare for the new fiscal year last night. I'm sure others can relate. And Starla said, um, and Connie, I think this comment kind of taps into some of your concerns too. The switch from full customer service to reasonable for a pandemic customer service is confusing for our patrons and the staff is taking some abuse over it. The city is telling me to report to the police, but at this time, I don't think it will be good for public sentiment towards the library, a hard balance. And Connie says that our tax paying rate is on track. Um, and yeah, I guess that's, that is sort of, Starla, I know that you've mentioned before in, in previous meetups um, how some, some people are okay with the new precautions and are appreciative and, and grateful that the library is open, um, but then there are also some people who don't understand why things can't go back to how they normally were um, and aren't being as understanding as they, as they could be, um, and then combined with the unfortunate politicization of, of things to help keep public health and safety a thing. Um, yeah, this is further complication on top of um, addressing budgets in general, even under normal, normal circumstances. 
Um, and the issue of, you know, bringing police into it too. Another one of the sessions I went to with, was working with tribal libraries and um, the presenter there said that, you know, having police in the library is definitely unwelcoming to you know, large portions of the population. So it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, there's a no win here. Uh -huh. And I guess sort of going back, I'm not really sure. I personally have not heard any conversations about it. Well, it's been sort of interesting um, thinking about the, the recent rise in cases and whether or not as a state, Montana would go back to phase one or even shelter in place and kind of just imagining the varied reactions to that, which I, it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Um, at this point, but I was just sort of personally imagining that in my mind. Um, and just the rise in cases uh, around this, the country. Um, there's been a, a huge spike in cases all over um, and how different areas are reacting to that. Um, and it's just interesting to think that with the 32 cases that we had on March 26th, we issued a shelter in place. Oh, that was 35 cases. And now with 32 cases, um, on the 19th, it feels like it didn't seem to make much of a, um, an impact. Um, oh, Kara says that a few counties have regressed to phase one. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So that's happening on a county by county basis, I guess. Um, I did not know that. Thank you, Kara, for sharing. Um, I know Bighorn County tightened up there their regulations because they were pretty hard hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess this is something that we might have to brainstorm some more and, and think about further. Um, and I think we all probably know that the, the full effects of things probably won't be felt until a little bit later or even a lot later as well. Um, but thank you all for sharing stories about this and actually putting some, some detail into what this issue looks like. Um, I think that'll help us as we brainstorm going forward. Um, let other people know also that they're not alone in, in thinking about this. Um, and if you all have any ideas or any questions, um, let us know and we can also take that into consideration as well. Um, if there's anything that might be helpful with this, um, I'm not sure if there's messaging that we could provide or templates or something to help at least convey to people how much libraries are doing. Um, but that's something that I guess we'll also consider and, and think about too. Um, Amelia, I just want to remind everybody that, um, you know, we had three successful no levy campaigns this month for dedicated library funding in the Bitter Ridge in Glasgow and, and in Glendive where the situation was really dire. And uh, as was stated earlier, that's one of the surest ways to um, I think grapple with some of the political realities that are challenging funding for libraries uh, because it's really up to the voters, not up to a, a commission to decide. Um, we can all appreciate when revenues decline and the impact that that has on our budget. But at least if a community has a successful no levy campaign, in some ways you can take the the politics out of some of those annual budget discussions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's a lot to be grateful for for those communities and a lot to learn from their successful efforts. And, and really, um, there's no time like the present to begin planning for that kind of campaign if a library chooses to do so. Um, we really do see uh, routinely communities coming out and strongly supporting 
funding for their libraries when those questions are put before the voters. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jenny. That's a really good reminder. And part of that campaign is just advocacy. So, um, you know, even if you should happen to decide at some point not to go for the mill levy, um, you know, if you've done the steps towards it in, you know, trying to make your case for the library and for the mill levy, um, you know, you've got a pretty good case for advocating for the value of your library. Um, a couple other comments. Connie says that you have a, another question and Starla said, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and California are pouring in here. It's hard for businesses in the community to not look at them as a good thing. The people who live here are terrified by the influx. So there's also that very real tension in the community as well. And Connie, did, if you wanted to ask your question. Um, I thought you might have some insight to this. I heard an unofficial rumor that the governor is turning over um, kind of all the decision making about the phases to the local governments and that it won't be kind of a statewide movement again. And I know that in our county, I don't know if it's like a statewide, but there was always the understanding that we could do, the county could do more restrictive uh, measures if needed, mm -hmm. I believe. But, you know, it's a pretty, um, volatile time politically here in this community. So it's mm -hmm. a little bit confusing to me how our, how our state will have a kind of a cohesive message about the urgency of the pandemic if it's mm -hmm. left to so widely to different local authorities. Then yeah, also that really um, changes how the library can respond. Mm -hmm. Depending on because it has become so politicized, depending on what the local, you know, government um, skews towards, there could that could really impact the amount of safety measures we can put in place at our libraries that will be accepted by our community. It looks to that leadership for kind of the green light. Mm -hmm. That's a question and a and a comment. But I guess that is there any meat to that kind of informal rumor? Um, Honey, well, I sure I, haven't oh, heard that. Okay. I don't know if others have. I, I have I have heard about counties creating more restrictive guidelines than what the governor has put in place. Um, and that that ha has been his approach throughout the pandemic to put together a, a statewide plan but allow counties to be more restrictive if they feel the need to, but not less restrictive. I did right. read that the governor's n not planning to uh, roll back any of the, the phases at this time, but mm. I had not, I have not heard um, that he's planning to no longer make state level decisions. Okay. So I, I couldn't verify that or not. Maybe it was getting to that end that the there wouldn't be no state movement backwards <laughs> in the faces. Mm -hmm. And so that would be that, fully up to. Yeah, that, exactly. That, that's the most recent that I've heard. Uh, and then I have a, a, a follow-up question to that. Would there, I guess, would there moving forward be any more state guidance about, or any firmer state guidance about mask wearing in public spaces? Has there been conversation about that? Um, I, not for businesses that I'm aware of for state government. Uh, the direction for us is that if we are interfacing with the public, we have to be wearing masks and that masks will be provided for members of the public and they're encouraged to wear them, but it's not mandatory. So mandatory for employees, but not necessarily necessarily the public. Are there any libraries that are currently requiring masks? I'd love to hear how that's going. Susie, I do know that um, I think the Bitterroot Public Library required masks, requires masks. Um, I don't think 
Mark is on this call today. Uh, but they that stopped was... requiring them. And they stopped requiring them. Oh, did they? They did, but when I spoke to Mark or by email, he was saying, I mean, they may consider it again in the future. They haven't talked about that, but they did stop for now. Okay. Um, and then Mitch says yes with some grumbling. So Mitch, are you still currently requiring them? Yes. How has that been going? <laughs> and uh, with uh, Gail's comment, today's Bozeman Chronicle editorial was urging MSU to mandate masks for student and staff that return in the fall. Jody says, we are requiring masks in Red Lodge. Currently, patrons only enter the library for computer appointments, printing, copying, scanning, also available. Mitch says that some grumbling. Um, Gail says, Belgrade is requiring masks. Our board passed a policy. We wrote into the policy that we have identified vulnerable staff. For the most part, it has gone well. Um, and then Gail said, actually, some patrons from other libraries are coming here because we are requiring masks. Uh, and Starla said, our board has decided that if we get a case in the county, we will require everyone that enters the library to wear a mask. Uh, Christine said, our staff is not wearing masks. Most patrons do not. So <clears throat> apparently I'm not going to type. Um, so has anybody done anything where they, they just required masks um, if people want one-on-one -on -one assistance? Um, like, you can come in and just check out your books and leave, but if you want us to help you on the computer or the copier, you have to wear a mask. I don't think I've heard anything like that in the conversations in the meetup so far. Um, I do know that in the past, when we've talked about mask policies, um, it's well within board authority to create whatever policy. So I think you could create a policy around that, um, but I don't think there's any specific language so far that's come up around requiring masks for one-on-one -on -one help. Um, that's been happening informally with one staff member in Big Fork. <laughs> it's been going well for her here in I imagine if libraries, um, but we're getting ready to ask the board on Thursday to require masks. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been urging people to wear masks and we have them for free. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a lot of people just, if it's not required, they're like, oh, good. And I think that it's just human nature that it's like, well, it must be safe too. If we're saying you can be in here without a mask, we must know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think we have a lot of plexiglass and tape and wayfinding, all these things, but it's also human nature to just, as social beings, get as close, even trying to edge around the see-through plexiglass to talk to us. So yeah. it hasn't, we've been trying it for like three or four weeks. We've just been urging people and it hasn't been working. I don't think there has been a way for us to really social distance consistently. And we also, even with decreased hours, saw 400 people in last Tuesday. So it's just a lot of people, even if they're not within six feet of us, it's more than we feel comfortable with. Yeah, 400 people is a lot. Um, and thank you, Connie, for sharing all of that. There's been some more chatter in the, in the chat box. Um, Connie asked, do you mind emailing mask policies? Um, and actually, do you mind emailing me as well? Um, and then I can actually post it. And if you're comfortable with posting it, I can also get rid of, of identifying information. Um, so that other people can see it. Um, so Connie, if you want to put your email in the chat box, Gail said she'd be happy to email it to you. Mitch said, rather than have to meet every three days to adopt a new policy, my board authorized me to enact whatever restrictions I want in cons cons consultation with the county health department. Nancy said she was also interested in the mask policy. Jody says, even with a mask on, one-on-one -on -one assistance can be uncomfortable. Patrons are generally thoughtful. Yesterday, I logged on to the patron's job application on my computer while she stood at a distance. I wore gloves when I needed to do something on the computer the patron was using. She also says, we allow bandanas, scarves, but the face covering must cover the mouth and nose. Um, Debbie says, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. And then Connie has put in her... Um, email information. And I will put in my email information um, 
as well. So if you all have those policies, please do email them to me as well. Any other questions or comments about the masks? And Susie, have, have, have you, um, when doing one-on-one -on -one assistance, um, has there been pushback already when you're asking people to stay a little bit further away? Or do you get the feeling that people wouldn't be receptive to uh, an explicit policy or not sure what your well, situation is? Well, we are asking people to stay away and mm -hmm. then and they nod oh yeah yeah and then <laughs> and they're then they just don't do it and mm -hmm. so then um i mean we had to go i had to be a manager and come help somebody because somebody was like i've asked them three times to stay back and they're not staying back and then it kind of wasn't great um and it's just like the six feet away is just really, it's, it's really hard. Um, we could put tape on the floor, but it's just, it, I don't know. Yeah. So they're, they're not saying, no, I won't stay six feet apart. They're just not doing it. They say yes. And then they don't do it. <laughs> yes. They say Which it, is they even say more yes, challenging. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe in that instance, an explicit policy might be helpful. Um, I don't know, it's kind of hard to predict because um, it's not, you're not saying that you won't help them. It's just they have to meet certain requirements in order for you to help them. <laughs> uh, Michelle said, staff is wearing masks when they are away from desks and the other side of the plexiglass, um, but we are not requiring that patrons wear a mask, although 75% are wearing them on their own, which is pretty good. Michelle, that's actually pretty great. Um, she also asked Gail if you could email her the policy as well. And Michelle, if you want to put your email into the chat box, um, I think that would help Gail. Gail says, heads up, our policy is very basic, simple and to the point. And I'm gonna try and find some mask policies um, from other libraries and see if I can find those and share those out. So um, if I find any, I'll also make sure to send that out on Wired or, or something like that. Any other questions? Have people had difficulty with the um, time limits and the restrictions for being in the building. I wonder, it's not exactly the same thing as the mask restriction, of course, but you know, if, if people are reacting similarly, that might give you an indication of how people might feel. <laughs> Starla says, oh yes. Um, Michelle says, with Yellowstone open, we are getting busier. Today was the first day we ran out of seating room with the new configuration. We will monitor it considering implementing time limits. Limits. So far, everyone is respecting the six foot distance, which is good to hear. We had our, this is Connie, we had our first issue with it I, that I've heard about today. And someone's student daughter came back to town and sat down, we had all the furniture removed, sat down, and was working on a test when she was told to leave. Um, usually people are like, oh yeah, 30 minutes, I got it, and they'll just kind of do it. But she was very angry and went to Facebook and kind of mobilized her friend group. So we're dealing with a bunch of responses now of folks being angry. Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of been unfortunate, but our first, that's our first issue. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's tough too, Connie. Um, Jody says, of course, some people are really slow on computers and some applications legitimately take a long time. Again, there have been uncomfortable experiences, but we have rolled with it and accommodated when possible. Uh, 
Um, Starla said, I have offered to make appointments for people outside of open hours if they need more time. So that's also, I guess, a good way to address anyone who has had, who might have issues with the time limits. Any other questions or comments? Mitch asked, I'm curious if libraries are implementing time limits because they're so busy they need to allocate seating or directly out of some health concern. I think it was a combination of both time limits and people limits too. Um, I think it was most common for a limit of 10 people, 30 minutes each. I think. Um, this is Connie again. I hope it's okay that I'm talking. Someone else said they were no, a real slow typer and I feel like that is me as well. <laughs> Um, from what I understand, and again, we're not getting like consistent, I feel, and like very direct information, but from what the reading I've done, it's the concentration and duration of your exposure. So because a lot of people are not wearing masks in our community, we felt that moving people quickly in and out was a good strategy for having possible less exposure to someone who may be infected. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks for explaining that, Connie. Um, Jody says, and Mitch, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to, to put those in there. Jody says, I would back up what Mitch said earlier. If possible, ask your board to allow managers and staff more leeway than maybe normal when interpreting policies. Um, and Starla said that they're doing the time limits out of health concern here. And Christine also said, would you email the link for the plexiglass grant, please? Um, and I'm not sure who that is directed to. So if, Christine, if you know who that is, uh, please feel free to mention them in the chat box. Um, and also put your email down if you would like. Um, I just remember reading an email about a grant. I can't remember when it was. So um, if anybody remembers when that was or if they got one, if they would email it to me, that'd be great. I'll put my email in the chat. Yeah, and I think maybe you're talking about the um, COVID grant that both Susie and Gail um, from Belgrade and Great Falls respectively applied for. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe if you, Gail, if you don't mind sending that to Christine, or I'll try and remember to do that afterwards. Um, let's see, Starla says, I would think about extending the time if everyone would wear a mask. <laughs> yes. Um, but then I don't think we'd be discussing this if everyone were wearing a mask too. <laughs> um, Oh, and Jody says, I believe the Department of Commerce grant closed on June 12th. So that was the grant that we had been talking about earlier, Christine. Um, if anyone knows of other grants, please do feel free to mention those. Just to let you all know, it is approaching four o'clock. So if you need to head out, that is totally fine. I will still keep the recording going um, as we move through the rest of the material so you can catch uh, anything that you might have missed. But if you need to head out, please feel free to. Um, and thanks so much for a really great discussion. Um, I think these are a lot of really important concerns and issues to be thinking about. Um, so feel free to email us with any other questions that you have. Um, and this is probably something that we'll discuss more in the future as well. So just to move onwards, um, we were going to talk a little bit about virtual programming today, but I might table this for another time so that I don't take up too much more time um, today. Uh, but just some, if, if Jessica is on the call, if you want to give a quick update about IMLS statistics, um, that might be helpful. Sure, I can do a really quick overview. Um, so IMLS is going to be adding I think 12 or 14 questions to the public library survey this year and um, they're all COVID related and they are mostly yes or no. Um, like, Was your library open? Did you add increased services? Were staff reallocated to other um, 
other positions, I believe it is. Um, and there are two questions that were required numbers, and those are number of weeks an outlet or branch was closed due to COVID, and number of weeks it had limited occupancy. So um, we've been working with the Public Library Statistics Task Force to see what kind of questions we want to add to the survey. And we have not quite settled on it yet, but we will have an answer soon. Um, we were kind of waiting to see what IMLS is going to do. We're going to be keeping it as simple as possible, and um, we are going to ask for virtual programming numbers. And this will be a an optional question because it is so last minute, but we really just kind of want to get an idea of um, what kind of or how many virtual programs libraries were able to offer and what kind of um, attendance they got. So the hard part about that is going to be figuring out how to track those attendance numbers. So that's why we're going to keep it so simple. So right now we're thinking of adding just a couple of questions. Um, how many virtual programs did you offer and how many people attended? Um, and we're going to have to break down live versus people who um, maybe watch the recordings afterwards. But um, like I said, we're going to try to keep it simple. And that's not to say that libraries can't keep detailed statistics on their own. Our worry is really that everybody is going to be using different platforms and there's different kinds of reports that you can get out of that. So if one person is using Facebook Live and somebody else is posting things to YouTube, we really don't want to um, mess up the numbers too much. So. Look forward to email updates soon about that once we kind of settle on something. And I will also be working on some, um, some guides to completing the public library survey and hopefully putting those out on Zoho soon as well. Awesome, thanks so much, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And actually, do you mind putting into the chat box just like a quick bullet point of things we're considering on asking just so people have that um, in the chat box if they want to save that. Sure. Um, no I know that you're still determining that, but um, just for people to know. Um, sorry, that's my bird clock. It's four o'clock now. <laughs> um, and another question to consider for the future are what are your plans for programming if in-person restrictions extend beyond the summer and we're in winter and you can't do things outside? Um, so that's something that I think we'll table for our next meeting. Um, but I think, you know, at this point, people have been doing some virtual programming, have probably figured out ways to do it. Um, and this might be a good time to start sharing what's been working for your library um, and what questions you have. Um, Gail also just shared a link in the chat box um, with the mask policy reopening plan. So if you want to take a look at that, I believe that has their mask policy. Um, a few last things to mention. So there is um, a library service status survey and map. Um, so some of you have already filled this out, but there is a survey that you can uh, fill out to report your service status. And if your building is open uh, without restrictions or with restrictions, if you're doing curbside, et cetera, et cetera. And all that data that you submit is then displayed in a data dashboard, um, which is a really great way to see what other people are up to. So I'm going to actually show you what this looks like. This is the dashboard. You can see that 57 libraries have reported. You can see here um, how many people's buildings are open with restrictions, without restrictions, the types of services offered. So especially as you're having conversations about reopening with your local health departments and they want to know what are other libraries doing, what's, what's going on, this is a great way to show them that, yeah, some libraries are open, but most of them are with restrictions. Um, and maybe that can help you in your conversations as you're trying to find um, a plan that works for everybody involved. So this is just a reminder to take a look at this. It gets updated um, every time somebody submits something. Um, and um, to also remind you to fill it out if you have not yet done that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that into the chat box. And I'm gonna interrupt right here really quick. This is just oh, yes. again. Um, I just wanted to point out that if you've already taken the survey for your library, but something has changed, you can take it again. And what it's going to do is it will create a duplicate entry and I just go in and remove the older entry. So it's okay to keep updating it as things change and as your services change. Awesome, thanks for that reminder, Jessica. 
Um, and thanks for also creating this. This is great. I love it. I've been using it and sharing it with a lot of people. So please do also feel free to share this with anybody. It is on our website. It's meant for anyone to look at and refer to. Um, let me go back to my PowerPoint. Um, if you have any questions about the um, survey, feel free to let me know. You can also reach out to Jessica. Um, but here we go. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention are just some new resources. So in the COVID Economic Development Guide, um, there's actually a webinar that was released on the 18th that's called uh, Business Reference in Libraries for Public Librarians. Um, and it covers the main three questions that people are asked, that librarians are asked with business reference. So like, what's my market? What are the trends? Um, and another question that I don't remember <laughs> at the moment. But this webinar is available, the recording is available on Niche Academy for anyone who would like to watch it um, and has some really good information in there. So I'm going to put that link into the chat box. Business reference webinar. Um, there's also an OCLC library services map. This was an email that was sent out earlier today. Um, and this is a really interesting map to look at just to see, I'll put this in the chat box. I believe there are thousands of libraries that have, that have contributed to this map all around the world, um, showing the different status of their library. So showing if they are accepting returns, not accepting returns, lending items or not lending items. So this might not be as useful as the Montana library dashboard, but if you want to know what's happening um, with COVID response, this OCLC library services map is a, is a good way to, to get a general feel for that. Um, we were also kind of curious to see if there were ILL questions. Um, I believe actually Mary had, uh, Mary somebody, I don't remember her name, had sent out this, the OCLC library services map on Wired. Um, and so at the State Library, we were kind of wondering if that was something people wanted to learn more about with interlibrary loans. Um, Mary Guthmiller, thank you, Kara. <laughs> um, so if that is something of interest, please let us know and we can, ask Mary to maybe come in and talk about that at our next meetup or see if there are other people with expertise who can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we wanted to check and see. Um, and A. Ebby is said that they would be interested in ILL statistics. Um, I don't know if we have st the statistics. I think I was more interested on um, if ILLs were happening I guess, and how people were doing them. Um, do we have those statistics? I'm not actually sure. <laughs> For OCLC? From OCLC, yes. The, yes, you can retrieve the, those from the OCLC statistics, statistics portal if you have your authorization code and password. And if you do not have that, please get in touch with me and we'll get you set up. This is Kara. Um, and A. Ebby, if you could put your full name, I'm actually not sure who you are, um, just so that we can do follow up if you just enter that into the chat. I know, box. I know, I know. Do you know who it is? It's Alice. Ebby Alice. from, okay. from um, Imagine If. Okay, <laughs> okay, great. Yay, I'm glad so many of you. <laughs> it's not like we have that many Ebbies, you know, across the state. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Um, Nancy also said that she'd be interested in uh, what libraries are doing with ILL. Um, so that is good to know. Um, and then I also just included the link to the Battelle Realm Library Materials Research Project from IMLS and Web Junction. I have included that into the COVID general guide. Um, and that was just the, the research information that I covered in the beginning of the webinar. So that is it for today. I'm sorry that we went over again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording for now.